parks are meant to be a tranquil place, lush with trees and welcoming to visitors. But one fateful morning, an innocent man found himself in the wrong park at the wrong time, faced with a violent attacker. Years of untreated mental health issues culminated in this nightmare encounter. Could anything have prevented this attack? This week's episode is The White Rock Machete Murder. Up uh, in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. It's good to be back in Dallas. I uh, got delayed. Good to have you back. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, New York City, for having me. Did not marry a rat king, unfortunately. Aww. But I ate Taco Next Bell. <laughs> I ate Taco Bell twice while I was there. Oh well, that's just uh, disgusting. And any, wrong. No, that's, that's like a regular weekday <laughs> for <my> me. <laughs> I also had a gluten-free bagel with lo- an everything bagel. I got yelled at because I didn't know what an everything bagel oh, was. Oh, it has everything on it. Yeah, it turns out I got a bagel with lox and cream cheese. I felt very New Yorky, mm. and I drank. Did you have capers on it? I don't think so. It just was cream cheese and lox, mm-hmm. Nova Scotia lox. Oh, very good. I love me some lox. They were good. And I had a Levain's Bakery. They make gluten-free cookies. I got so many DMs when I posted a picture of this cookie. It's apparently very famous. Oh, nice. Shout out to Caroline Fancher, who was our uh, the tour walking, guide? little tour guide. She lives in New York, about to, about to be back in Dallas. But she took us and got this cookie about the size of my fist. Was it a black and white cookie? It was. Not, <laughs> unfortunately, it was, <laughs> it was chocolate chip, but it was oh, nice. almost, it was about this big. Wow. It was like, a, I'm, I'm balling Wait, at my fist. Like, it's like dense like yes, your fist? It was or dense. just the size? So it was round and like, like a ball. It was a cookie biscuit. Okay, okay. God, it was good. Yes, I recently had some of those. Gosh, I can't remember the place. I sent you a picture of them and mm-hmm. said, when we refinanced our house, they gave us a bunch of cookies. You know, when it, yes, and they're from a local place. I will find out the name of this and let everyone know because they were also very dense and round. It's mm. almost as if you just plopped down dough yeah. and didn't bake it. Don't but it, it totally was baked. Yes, this was fully cooked. Yeah, but Man, they were so good. I Holy moly, it. they were good. I and she delivers it. much like, like Tip Streets, okay. but it's a Dallas local thing. Oh, I love it. And, and also, I will find out the name of this. Please do. I, I don't know if they have gluten-free. Probably not. But this one did, so I got a gluten-free. Know, but maybe since it's one person that owns it, you know, she may. You never know. Tip Streets. Does not. No. Because once I tried to t- send you Tiff Street. Well, that's so nice. And I discovered they do not have gluten free. Most. Th- I think there's another cookie place that does, but they're, they're not as good as Tiff Street. Mm, Tiff Street is really, if I really could, good. Yeah. God I, damn, they're good. And speaking so of good. good, I also saw Lonely Island and it was the second best was it concert good? I've ever seen in my life. Who was the first? Uh, John Mayer and Dave Chappelle. Oh, okay. <laughs> so good. Well, so you've seen the two best concerts of your life my, in the past year. It's true. It was so good. There a lot of bangers. The people next to me, the lady just goes, I really like Andy Samberg on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And her husband said, we drove here from Boston to watch the Harry Potter play and just saw that this was happening. So we just bought tickets. Oh, that's nice. And he goes, I've heard that Harry Potter play is fantastic. They said it was really good. And he goes, what is this? I said, oh, it's kind of like a comedy band thing. And he's like, oh, okay. And pretty soon and Caroline and I were uh, scream singing all the lyrics mm. and he just had this look of horror on his face. <laughs> I think he had never heard any of the the lyrics of Lonely Island. He, no, I probably not. There are a couple of lines. He that probably are... hadn't had them screamed at him either. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's one thing to listen to them in your car. It's another thing for two tipsy females to be <laughs> screaming them screaming. right next to, to you. To be fair, everyone was scream singing, except for these people. I think that's people. a concert where you scream sing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. any song that they decided to sing, everyone's excited. And Mike Birbiglia awesome. opened. It was a surprise opener. He's fantastic. He's my second favorite stand-up. He's amazing. He's great. First Dave being Dave, Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle's my first Okay, part. nice. Well, you've seen all your faves, <laughs> I so I don't only, only down to go from here, I think. Oh, I guess the Sorry. rest of the year. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. You're seeing John Mayer in a few months. And Backstreet Boys. And okay. Nate Bargatze, who I also love. So I, I got some stuff on the horizon. Yeah, there you go. It'll be fun. Well, I have... What do I have on the horizon? Hmm. We want to take Ella to see her first movie. <gasps> That'll be so fun. Toy right? Story 4. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. She loves the Toy Stories. We've been introducing all of them. I have seen Toy Story 1, 2, and 3 so much in the past month because you're trying to get her into it yeah she loves them okay and she'll watch a movie that's good so we think that she'll 
be captivated. My niece and Alamo watch- has where they do the movies for all, where they turn the lights yes. half down and people with special needs can go and people with families. And it's not as strict as the normal Alamo. Draconian. Where you'll get kicked out upon. Get your child uh, out of here. A whisper. Yeah. This is Toy Story. So, and they have ones where it's an all you eat cereal, all you can eat cereal buffet. Okay. Call me. I would go. I just had, <laughs> yeah. I went to the Seinfeld restaurant and I ordered cereal. Oh, that's awesome. It was so good. Did it look like it inside? No. It's just the outside, it's just right? Outside. Yeah. That's yeah. what I thought. That's still cool though. Yeah. It was still nice. Yeah. So that's on my horizon. That'll be so fun. Yeah. I haven't seen that yet. I want to see. Story, I story, haven't story either. Four. So no spoilers, please. Yes. People don't send any spoilers. Also, uh, probably bigger than Ooh. that tonight. I will be watching the season finale of Love Island season two. Oh, you're getting, I you finally got... have made my God damn. There's so many episodes in these. There's like 40 episodes. Wow. I think when they're actually happening, they, fo- they show one every night. Wow. Yeah. Which is a commitment to how many, watch. How many seasons is it so far? I think four. I think they're on their fourth. Oh, you see, so you're not, it's not over. <sighs> no, no. You got more to go. No, no it's thank not God. over. Thank God. Yeah, I got a lot to look forward to, but I will be watching the finale tonight. Of season two. So by the time this airs, if you got any hot takes on Love Island season two. I've got a lot of hot takes. It's, it's, this season Christy. has not been good. In the past week that I've been watching, though, my God, has the drama picked up. The, are people getting arsed? <laughs> so arsed. <laughs> so very arsed. The thing with this show is... They love, the producers love to really try and fuck with these people. It's almost uncomfortable and God. very, as the Brits would say, cringy. How bad do you want 50,000 pounds? We're yeah. going to torture you. Yeah. Which they split, by the way. Oh, oh, so you only it's get- not even that much money to be up for what they do, but they bring in people's exes. Oh my Can God. Can you imagine you're like chilling? You couldn't pay me $50 million. <laughs> I, know, I, know. Dollars. I know. I would not do it. I, I hate awkward situations so much. No, I'd quit the show. Yeah. I'd I, rather be on Naked and Afraid where there's a zero dollar prize <laughs> than to and potentially you're naked with a stranger. Who cares? That's fine. Yeah. Check, you know what? You're welcome, strangers. This is what you get to yeah. see. Well, it all, it never goes well. I'll tell you that when oh. the ex comes in, oh. bad things always happen. Good. Lord, well, I'm glad you've had some bubble gum for the brain. I think you and I Thank both you. have had some some uh, struggles with this, this episode. One, I this had a one legitimate has been real rough. I had a nightmare about it. Like woke up screaming, <laughs> like you were being attacked. Like I was watching this. Oh, and gosh, yeah. yeah, and then the perpetrator was walking towards me, and then yeah. I screamed myself awake. It's uh, I've, I told you the other day of all the episodes we've done, this one has been the hardest for me. Yeah, I straight up cried in the car for twenty minutes straight the other what? day, <laughs> driving. From my house to the little gym, which should be a really fun place to Normally, go. <laughs> what makes you, when you're feeling like the world is a horrible place, what makes you feel better? Like videos of baby pandas or like what? That's just an example. Um, well, the when I was kittens. in the car, I couldn't really do much because I can't watch a video of no, a no, baby no. panda while I'm driving. Um, but like a salve for your brain. Therapy. Okay. Honestly. I was trying to think of something we could tell the listeners to send to, to you. To, but. Oh. <laughs> well, I love... Did you have vouchers for therapy I, I've got a group on for some <laughs> therapy sessions. Um, I, I think about Ella and how much I love her. No. But then sometimes that will send me even further yeah, down makes you the cry rabbit more. hole. Because I'm like, the like world God, so Jesus Christ. Protect yeah. her, please. Um, I... I I decided to put on Disney songs. Oh, that'll help. Which, my God, have you ever really listened to some of the lyrics of these Disney which songs? Which ones? Uh, name one. They're sexist as hell. Oh. I was like, what is this? Hercules? Oh, it's Her- Hercules. What the fuck? It is just like, do it for a woman. She needs to be pale, have big eyes. Oh, I'm God. Like, what is happening here? I don't want any. And so... I don't know. So that that was not helpful. Well, I will say shout out to Fisk Lever on Instagram. She sent us this lovely compilation where they have uh <laughs> they've drawn Keanu Reeves's face into Disney princes. Oh, that's fun. So all the princes He looks look- kind of like a Disney oh, prince. Oh, he does. Or so- a villain. He could be either. But like look at that. That's hot. Yeah. It's pretty good. That one's so, good. So this Aladdin. is a good if you're into the Disney, it looks a lot like Keanu Reeves. It does. So we'll repost it on our Instagram for you all. But that's a nice, a nice, that's salve, nice yeah. salve for the brain. I like 
things of pigs. That's true. Little baby pigs. Big, so, uh, pig videos are cute. Oh, I'm a vids. big fan of unlikely friendships bet- between animals. Okay. If you have unlikely friendship animal videos, please send them. If it's like a duck them. and an elephant or best friends or yes. something like that. So I, cute. I love that. Yeah. A big lion and a little kitten. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's. Although those. Orangutan and a little kitten. That one's cute. Yeah. Love it pig and a lot and a tiger yes when they dress the pig up like the tiger because the mom abandoned it and then the tiger took it under its paw wing yeah, yeah. paw uh man god how did it not eat it <laughs> i mean it's it's <laughs> inclination it's a vegetarian. Would be to eat it a vegetarian tiger that sounds like a kid's book i should write you should the I vegetarian know. tiger. Elle, Elle is a vegetarian tommy so. the vegetarian tiger oh my gosh copyright tommy you write that dibs. instead of me dibs okay well this has been a hard one so it we're is. just gonna warn everybody it's got a lot of discussions of violence yeah mental health issues mm-hmm. and a uh, slight sexual assault and it happened Right About here. 15 minutes from where Heather and I live. Pretty close to home. And I remember when this happened. I it- very, very clearly remember when it's happened. And our dear friend Laura Goff reminded me the other night that the same day this incident happened, a murder-suicide happened across town on the same day. Wow. And then I believe it was the next day or the day after was when that young girl got kidnapped at the red box. Oh, that's right. Was that was right over here too. Yeah. It all happened within like three or four days of each other. It was a really difficult time in the city of Dallas. Yeah. Cause normally we really crime. don't have that much. We don't hear that much about the like, high profile. No, but did you hear about the couple that got killed of Ron Gaston in their apartment the other day? Oh, I saw it on next door. Yeah. So I didn't see specifically some neighbor just said, wow, this neighborhood's really going down. It is. I used to live over there, too. So Dallas has a, some crime problems. Taking a turn. It is. It has gotten worse in recent years, which uh, my mother it does not like. Well, nor do I. But having her same. daughter live here and her granddaughter. But we're safe. I think so. We've got good good dogs and good security systems. True. I got videos. Unfortunately, this man thought he was safe too. And this is a situation where no one could have predicted. Well, no, he could not have predicted this is how his morning would go. That this upon setting out for his afternoon or his morning run. Agreed. Like it's you, you have a life plan. Mm -hmm. You have a a plan by the next minute, the Mm -hmm. next hour, the next day, the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then it's like a freight train in one second. And that's, these stories are get to me more than others because of that, Mm -hmm. because it's not a serial killer that was planning something and you see this methodical planning and then they capture someone. It's just literally this guy. It could have been anyone. This Mm -hmm. guy wasn't, it it was nothing personal against this guy. It's a complete lottery. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a complete lottery. If he had been five minutes late that day, it Mm -hmm. wouldn't have been him. Yeah. Or five yeah. minutes early, you know. Yeah, know. yeah. It's it's just one of those things that sends a ripple through everyone's lives. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather, and we are talking about the White Rock Machete Murder, which is kind of just a coined phrase. I don't know. I think the news was calling it that. Yeah, yeah. So you also hear it referred to as like the White Rock Jogger. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. So let's get into it. Thomas Johnson was born in the Dallas neighborhood of Oak Cliff in April 1994. He was raised by his mother, Linda Hanks, who had Thomas after fleeing with a truck driver who lived in her apartment complex. She considered Thomas a blessing and raised him as a single mother, having never married Robert, Thomas's father, and fighting frequently with him over what was best for their son. Robert had multiple convictions for theft. It would show up intermittently, causing Thomas's face to light up with joy when he did. It's got to be kind of tough if you're raising him on your own and this guy kind of comes through. Oh, yeah. But he's trying. Shout out to every single parent out there. I do not know how you guys do it, but I my hat's off to you. Even if I have to when Tommy and I. Had to, it, the storm happened and Ella and I were out at my mom's, even though my mom's there, mm-hmm. the routine is different, you mm-hmm. know, and stuff. And even that is so stressful. Yeah. I can't imagine doing it by myself every day, especially if you're working multiple jobs or Good off God, hours. Man. And- they are the true heroes of this world. It's amazing. Despite struggling to make ends meet. Linda provided a beautiful home for Thomas with all the trappings of a fun-filled childhood and saved money to take him on trips to places like Disney World and Washington, D.C. A Christian woman, Linda also raised Thomas with a strong faith. 
telling him to look to the Bible whenever in need of answers or guidance. Yeah, I think they said he, she kept a Bible on her nightstand. And if he said, hey, mom, a kid was mean to me at school. What do I do? She'd say, well, let's look it up. And then they would look up passages in the Bible. So real very religious and raised him to be, you know, sort of follow, follow the, the footsteps. Christ path. Yeah. From as early as nine years old, Thomas was an athletic standout, even setting a world record in his age group for the long jump at the Junior Olympics. Linda recognized how talented her son was and supported and encouraged his abilities. At 11 years old, Thomas was playing for a travel football team in Arlington, a suburb of Dallas, when he met and became best friends with the son of a wealthy businessman. For three years, Thomas spent every weekend with the insanely rich family who even paid for Thomas to attend Oak Ridge, a private high school in Arlington, and took him on vacations to their privately owned island in the Caribbean. Their privately owned island. And that's island rich. That's the only other person I know that has that is Johnny Depp. Richard Branson has an island. Yeah, that's so big A-list celebrities are the type of people that have islands. I bet to have an island, you'd have to have minimum, minimum, minimum net worth of like 50 million mm -hmm. and probably more than that just to run it and stuff like that. You could buy a tiny little island with nothing on it. Yes. And, and by tiny, I mean one of those that you see in a cartoon where they've been marooned. <laughs> there's one single palm <laughs> there's tree. There's one palm just tree. Just one palm and tree. And each guy is sitting on either side of it, and that takes up the entire island. Well, That's the type of island that I still couldn't afford. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I, maybe that kind of, you can have tiny island money. You have to have like $10 million. Yeah, yes. If you're on Not a, even close. If you're on a desert island, what's your desert island movie? Wow. That you would take. It was the, it's the only thing you can watch. Big Lebowski. Oh, wow. The Burbs. Those are two of my faves. The Burbs, man. I could probably watch The Burbs over and over I again. I just saw our friend Jamie posted on Instagram a shirt. She had a Burbs shirt on, and I said, oh, my God, I need this shirt yeah. immediately. What did it say? It just, it was the, the logo. Uh, anarchy logo. <laughs> or I think it was a, a uh, like, satanic logo with all their faces in it. I it was really it. fun. It's such a good movie. It's so good. There go the goddamn brownies. <laughs> I could quote that movie all day. The, one of those, also Clue, probably any one of those three. You do love Clue. I love <laughs> Clue so much. Those are three movies that, and Shawshank Redemption, even though it's a bit different. If I am like watching TV and I see that any of those movies Stop are it. on, even if it's just started or there's 15 minutes left, I will go and watch it. Mine's probably Blues Brothers. Also great. Singing in the Rain, Ghostbusters, any of those. Original? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like the new one, too, but the original one I love, yeah. love, love. All, it's like ingrained great. in my brain. Yeah. So and good. probably Ferris Bueller's Day Off. All very good. Yeah. Those are my Desert Island movies. Who would you have there? On my Desert if Island? If you could only have one person with you. It, it Like, ever? Oh, God. <laughs> what about you? You can only have one person. Oh, my God. Yeah. You can't choose, right? I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to say Tommy because Ella, it would be too dangerous for her. Oh, that's true. And so I'd have to leave Tommy her Tommy can with help my you mom. survive. Yeah, and Tommy and I could build a raft to swim back to her as fast as possible. <laughs> I would choose Dwayne the Rock Johnson because he could help get me off the <laughs> oh, island. Oh, I would choose Tom Hanks because he's done it <laughs> he, before. That's true. He's got the background. <laughs> or anyone from Lost. From the television series. Yeah. Maybe I would pick my friend Asif Ali. He's on Wrecked on TBS. He's like, and that's that's like the Lost parody. So he's been on an island. He oh, knows how to get go. off. Yeah. <laughs> and he's really funny. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, you'd have to have somebody that's funny. He'd keep me laughing. For sure. In April of 2009, Thomas made headlines in a local magazine, but his mother wasn't so thrilled. The piece, titled Most Grateful Player, painted Thomas's life before living with the wealthy Earhart family as less than ideal. Feeling hurt and betrayed, Linda drove to Arlington and told the Earhart she wanted her son back as Thomas was now living with them full time. As he witnessed the conversation of his mother fighting for him, Thomas showed surprisingly little emotion. Yeah, I think that the article was painted a little bit like, this poor young yeah. black kid lived from, the worst life from ever. From the projects. And, and he really... Look at this wealthy white family... Saving that, him. ...that saved him and yeah. took over. Yeah. So it's a dangerous narrative that was not... I mean, they were a wealthy white family, and he was from Oak Cliff, but she was doing well for him. Yeah. I mean, she yeah. was taking care of him. He was a, a athletic standout at home. It wasn't like they came in and made him what he was. No, so. it wasn't as if she was an absent mother who was like wasn't around yeah or a drug addict it was never no. there or anything she like that or it was a dangerous working. situation for him yeah she was hard working Taking i care. can understand being very betrayed by that i think so too it's your kid you know 
Thomas's football career began when he enrolled at Skyline, a magnet school in Dallas, which has produced eight NFL players since 1994. He made a name for himself there as a star running back, becoming the fourth-ranked running back in the state and being ranked by ESPN as the number three receiver in the whole country. Thomas was being recruited by several colleges, and while he originally planned on attending the University of Texas, he changed his mind and committed to Texas A&M University and College Station. While Johnson only played for one season at A&M before dropping out in 2012, he had a good record, catching 30 balls for 339 yards. I mean, that's A&M and uh, UT are both both great schools, great both school great f- football schools, huge football schools, mm-hmm. and that's you're pretty much on track for the NFL. Yeah, absolutely. In November 2012, during a particularly important game, the number 15 ranked Aggies defeated Alabama, who were rated number one at the time. Johnson caught several passes from Johnny Manziel, the renowned quarterback who would go on to win the Heisman Trophy. This epic game would also be Johnson's last. I remember this game. It was a huge deal. Very, I, and we have many, many friends that I got are a, Aggies. A lot of Aggies in my life. Lots of Aggies in my life, too. And this was a huge deal. Johnny Manziel in, in general was a huge deal for that school. My oh, God. Yes. And then for a while, there was talks that he was going to be drafted by the Cowboys. And it was just like like, no one could deal with it. Bated breath. You know how you can tell somebody's an Aggie? Mm. They'll tell you. Yeah. They'll tell you every time. They'll shout about it. Yeah. That's the only thing. I I had a lot of things queued up in my head. And I was like, which is the least rude? Because a lot of our (laughs) friends are It's weird. For those of you outside of Texas, Texas A&M and University of Texas are rivals. They have a big rival game every year. Mm -hmm. And it's this. Although... UT doesn't really consider A and M their rival they because don't. they are elitist and, and and ranked a bit higher than them usually. They but it is still better. a really fun game because they're so close and everything. And the yeah, other located close, mm-hmm. but the Aggie is the t- is the mascot of the Texas A and M. That's what they're the Aggies or whatever. And people who went to A and M call themselves Aggies or they're mm-hmm. called that. And in Texas, it's a bit of a joke. That almost kind of like uh, a blonde jokes used to be, mm-hmm. yeah, or probably for some lawyer people jokes. still are lawyer jokes. There's a lot of Aggie jokes, yeah. And there. yeah, it's a fantastic school, and it's very hard to get into. Oh, and, so- it's, and people are very smart that go there, but somehow over the years, it's been painted as you're like blondes. It's you're dumb. They're dumb Ag- Aggie jokes. Yeah, but it which makes never sense. made sense to me because it's a really good. School. I know. I was like, it's an engineering school. Yeah, it's a very good school. Like, I don't get it, but it is a very. <laughs> cult like school correct you can't walk on the grass you have to wear these rings there's it's a so- lot of rules they have fish camp every year where all the incoming freshmen go and they learn all of these different yeah i guess rules for lack of a better term for instance norm social norms if they say you're the in if you're in a math class and yes. they say the year that you're graduating if I was in class and they said 2010 2002 and do you have to go whoop you have to like there's all these little things you have to do and it's this it's this culture that is not just on campus but the entire town of college station revolves around this university that is true and then alumni forever oh yeah yeah yeah, it's a huge it's a huge thing so it's interesting that he went here because it's it's supposed to be a very cohesive uniform Mm -hmm. like team camaraderie kind of place yes yeah, they don't have their names on their jerseys, I believe. They, Correct. The 12th man, 12th is, man is considered, the, the you as the audience. person watching the game is the 12th man. Yeah, so it's a, it's a huge football culture, for sure. For the past few months, Thomas Hutton seemed like himself. Rather than celebrate with the rest of his team after wins, Thomas would retreat to his room alone with his Bible for several hours on end. Like many college students, he had also begun smoking marijuana, and would occasionally use K2, the often dangerous and controversial synthetic marijuana substance. And I remember around this time that was K2 was a big issue because that one never in, done that because who well, knows? I'm also a, an adult now, but it just seems so d- dicey. I don't. You just don't know who's making it. No. At that same time, it was. I almost said people were smoking stevia. They weren't. That salvia. <laughs> You know what? <laughs> Sometimes a morning cup of joe, you want to fill it up with salvia. Yeah, you know, I stevia. put salvia in my coffee mm-hmm. and I smoke the stevia. Yeah, well, you're doing it wrong. But yeah, around that time, that was a big deal. These things were coming mm-hmm. out on the streets and the effects weren't really And known. everyone, because you could buy K2 at a, like like a, vape, a shop. vape shop or something, everyone thought it wasn't dangerous, but... 
that stuff is arguably way well i don't consider weed dangerous at all but that stuff is dangerous because it's synthetic it's not natural and you don't know what's going in it it's there's all sorts of drugs and chemicals and it makes your brain short circuit and you do crazy shit on it like jump out windows and stuff yes well according to thomas's roommate and football teammate he'd also become obsessed with the movie the book of eli and compared himself to denzel washington's character a nomad in a post-apocalyptic world who hears a voice giving him an important task to complete. And in the Book of Eli, I believe it's a post-apocalypse, and he has the only copy of the Bible. I've never seen it. And I, I have never seen it, but they were talking about it on, I think, Pete Holmes. They were talking oh, about yeah? it. Yes. And that he it's the only copy of the Bible, and he has to like basically preserve it's the only way to right. preserve christianity oh okay so it's very like concept. life or death task yeah so he considered himself that kind of guy well after winning the big game against alabama johnson missed practice the next day he then missed another practice coaches began to worry about him and contacted his mother she also had no idea where he was in fact thomas had decided to leave college station and walk back to dallas a 180-mile journey, taking with him only a knapsack that contained Bibles and an engagement ring for his girlfriend. So not a way I would get back from to Dallas. No, not something someone in their right mind would choose to do. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, he's deteriorating pretty quickly. Authorities all over Texas were searching for Thomas. His father found him three days later after Thomas had walked away from A&M hanging out at the home of a high school friend near Skyline High School. So he was now back in Dallas. He made it back to Dallas. He, the last trek of the journey, his feet were so blistered, he took off his shoes and walked barefoot. You've got some crazy well, blisters right now from walking current, around New York. <laughs> yes. I try to be cool, you guys. I'm at this age now where I can't be cool anymore. I need to just wear comfortable shoes. You should have worn orthopedics. I should have worn my orthope- my ortho Adidas. They're cloud foam orthos. I wore, but they're still Adidas, so they're still cool. They're still cool again. But I wore my chucks, my white chucks, because I was trying to be cool. I have on my left foot one of the hugest blisters. It's wild. It's like the size of a thumb. You said... It's really gross. Do you want to see it? Without a beat, I said yes. And I showed you. And then I gasped. <laughs> you did. And then I said, do you want to see the next one? It's super gross. And I showed her my right foot, upon which was once a blister, but then due to a tourist kicking me in the back oh, of the foot no! in God. Times Square has now turned to a blood blister. It And it's big. It's huge. It's, it's like <laughs> if the one is the, the regular blister is the size of a thumb, the blood blister is the size of like a silver dollar. Yeah. It's, it's huge. like the size of those cookies you ate. Yes. <laughs> it's the size of your fist. <laughs> well, I hope that it goes down soon because it looks like you can't wear any kind of shoes. Yeah. You gotta wear flip flops until I won't it goes wear away. Sling back pumps and then yeah. I have some mules I can wear and mm-hmm. then flip flops the rest of the time. But Good I. Good thing it's not the winter time. Yeah, it would have been bad. I can at least, you know, let it uh, the, air it, out. Well, the internet just said, don't poke it, which is uh, all <laughs> don't I can poke it because, you know, the first thing that people do is poke them. No lie. hundred percent. So I do. They ha- I the internet it. had to finally say, stop poking these. My plane got delayed going into New York. And so I ended up at the Omni at like one in the morning, one thirty, and I couldn't sleep because I was all wired up from the pl- flight. And I watched Dr. Ripple Bopper until I fell asleep. <laughs> you ever watch that on TLC? Have I never told you? About when I was pregnant, how I became obsessed with her. No, I didn't know that. Dr. Sandra Lee. Some people have ice cream and pickle cravings. You just wanted to see the mask (laughs) removed. It was so gross. Before I got pregnant, I had no desire to watch that kind of stuff. And since not being pregnant, I have no desire. But for whatever reason, during like my third trimester, I just wanted to see Sandra Lee pop some pimples. Yeah. Yeah. And I would watch YouTube videos of just the grossest things imaginable coming Same. out of people. I'm not pregnant. I have no excuse. I'm just <laughs> disgusting. My brother-in-law, Aaron, and I watched, uh, he said he was showing me bot fly videos where you have to like, pull oh, the water see, out. I can't deal that, do with that. Internet. Maybe when I'm pregnant, I'll <laughs> get back on that train. <laughs> well, yeah, well, if you need help, he and I can <laughs> send you a YouTube oh, playlist. It's I never so gross. Got, but, but what's interesting is when I would watch all of those, she would talk all the time about how, it's relaxing for so many people to watch and it yes. feels like there's like a sense of cleansing and release you get from it. Yeah. And like, 
And she's not wrong. This one is a guy from Georgia, and he's like, I got a lump on my shoulder. I call it my handle. My wife likes to grab onto it. <laughs> and he has this big lump on his shoulder. And when she lances it, of course, it look, she's like. Like wet newspaper? It looks like oatmeal. Yeah. Yeah. He goes, it does look like oatmeal with a little bit of cherry jam. And I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> it's always crazy He's to like, me I'm going to miss my nub. I like my nub. <laughs> it got that big. It was huge. I mean, I, I'm not judging, but I think before it got to where Tommy could grab onto it, grab I would have already sought help. Grab a hold to my handle. He's like, my wife loves it. And she's like, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I really don't. I'm the one who made this appointment. Exactly. You refused. And I said, I'm either leaving you or the nub goes. Yes, it's me or one the of nub. Those two things. You have to choose. So he ends up, so the, back to the story. Yeah. Thomas Johnson has walked from Texas A&M 180 miles to Dallas and is hanging with his high school buddy in the garage of the buddy's house. Yes. Thomas's father tried to coax Thomas out of the garage where his son and his friend were speaking, but failed to convince him. That's when Thomas's father called the police. As soon as Thomas saw police approaching, he took off running out a back door. When the police questioned the high school friend, he told them, Thomas is crazy. He believes he's Jesus. So we're starting to see how what has probably been a problem for a while is starting to finally manifest itself. More and more. He's yeah. starting to become a narrative almost mm -hmm. in his mind. The search was not over. Police scrambled a helicopter which hovered overhead as Thomas hid in a nearby park. He called his girlfriend, telling her, I'm hungry. I'm cold. Will you just come see me? His girlfriend immediately informed the police, who followed her as she drove to the park to meet Thomas. She allowed him into her car, cold and wet from the rain, and then proceeded to drive to a prearranged traffic stop. There, detectives took Thomas into custody without incident. He was transported and checked into a psychiatric hospital, Green Oaks, for evaluation for three days. Good on this girlfriend. Definitely. She was quite... I mean, I think she sees that he's struggling and everyone around him... Most of the people around him were extremely concerned for his well-being Correct. and were trying to get him help. Yes. There's only so much you can do, though. It's true. And at some point, you know, that's the issue is volitionally wanting to take the medicine or not, you know, it's or seek it's treatment. the old adage. You can lead a horse to water, but mm -hmm. you can't make him drink. I mean, you can't force someone to take medication. Absent uh, in imminent threat. You yes. Know? Yeah. Well, and like we've said so many times before. By the time it gets to be an imminent threat, it's way too it's late. too late. Yeah. yeah. Upon his release, Thomas confessed to his dad. Dad, I'm hearing these voices in my head. They're just telling me to do different things, stuff I don't want to do. Thomas's father took him to a facility for treatment, where he was officially diagnosed with schizophrenia. Unfortunately, Thomas refused all treatments and medication. He was quoted as saying, I don't want people to think I'm crazy. I don't want my classmates to think I'm a nut. I don't want people at school to think I'm crazy. It was a lot of stigma. There's so much stigma There's surrounding so mental health. so much stigma. And I think when people like mock people with mental health issues mm -hmm. or call people crazy, you're part of the problem Absolutely. that's creating this culture of people who are to, to me, I think it, taking medication, going to therapy is literally like as if, if you had a chronic illness like diabetes. You need yeah. to go to the doctor. You need, or if you have kidney problems, or if you have, you know, migraines or something. I don't even think. I think if you take medication, perhaps to me, therapy is something. It's like exercise. You should just do. Yeah, that's just part of your wellness plan. Yeah. If, it's like drink enough water. Yeah. Get yeah, therapy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's you, nothing wrong with you it. You go whatsoever. to the doctor once a year, a regular doctor for a checkup. They give you the old pap smear or Rooney if you're a lady. Mm -hmm. or, you know? uh, I had my first mammogram. Oh, that's right. How was a few that? Weeks ago. Not nearly as bad as I thought it I was, was very stressed, stressed about mammogram. Now. I've, I've heard if you have small boobers, it's much more painful. Oh, okay. I'm fine. Because they gotta like, pull your uh, tissue from the back to uh, get under the thing. Luckily, I just flopped them up. They were like, ma'am, there's too much here. <laughs> can you, can you can scoot get a, back some? We can get a sample from just the first half. <laughs> yeah, I was standing five feet away from the machine, and they still got a good sample. But it, it wasn't painful at all, and everything came back good, so oh, that was good. good so, but it is still very stressful. It's I didn't a stressful a, thing for a woman to go through. I was about to make a mean go Not mean go I was I didn't need a mammogram test for me to see that everything's good up there. <laughs> Wink. That was just me hitting on you. Oh, thank yeah, you. There. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, I just would worry about the pain of it but they don't mash it it's to not, completion no, no 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 i thought it was going to be mashed much harder than it was oh that's good. and it honestly and this one was curved 
oh, little nice. machine, which they were like, it hugs the breast, so it's not as painful. A hug is way better than a smash. Yeah, always. <laughs> Hulk hug sounds Hulk. less scary. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I've but the ones that are flat supposedly hurt quite a bit more. Ooh, so yeah. Well, good. And if you're out there and you think you might need therapy, go get therapy. And if it's time for you to get a mammogram, go get it. It's not scary. It's good for you. you Once need... you turn 40, I think you have to get one every year. Check you don't have to, but you should. But yes, absolutely. Go to therapy. There's nothing wrong with it. And one thing that's really interesting about him not wanting to take his medication because he didn't want his classmates to think he was crazy is no one knows you're taking medication. True. If that's something that bothers you, or you're embarrassed or you whatever. You don't, you only have to, you're not obligated to tell anybody yeah. that. It's completely up to you what you divulge to people. So he could have been taking this and leveled out. His classmates knew he was unhealthy because he was acting so crazed yeah he was acting abnormally i guess yeah. you know when people even if you don't want to go out and party but just shutting himself off and you know people can or study saying i think i'm jesus and yes. or being obsessed with this movie where you're convinced that you have the same calling that this man did so what's ironic is if he'd been taking medication those things probably would have gone away mitigated and he would have leveled out no one would have had to have known he was taking medication mm -hmm. He wasn't doing that, so therefore everybody knows there is a problem. Because of behavioral yeah. outbursts. Yeah, Absolutely. but there is such a stigma with taking medication for mental health that you immediately just become completely shut off to it, and yeah. no one can convince you otherwise. You just get it in your head that, like, no, that means I have a problem. That means I'm crazy. I've known people to do that with therapy. Yeah. I don't need therapy. If I can't solve my problems myself, then no one else can. There's what do you cut your own hair? <laughs> yeah. You eradicate your own kidney I don't even stones? do my own nails. No, you know? I don't. Because do I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. <laughs> like, I will always pay someone. I've said this before, that it's a professional in a field to do something yes, for me. Absolutely. If you, if you want someone to talk about Love Island, then yes, call me up. I'm a professional on Love Island. Just awkwardly spew facts about horrible, heinous crimes right here. I'm uh, your girl. Yeah, we can do that too. Or to be like, actually, did you know that the Constitution said that, that yeah. I'm not an annoying person? Yeah. But no, I needed a tree trimmer. I'm not going to cut my own no. trees. No, yes, I'm not. Yeah, and therapists are just there to be a sounding board. Yes. And to give you advice. They, you know, there's a stigma too that they're going to judge you or tell you how to live your life. That's not it at all. It's I like, have a fantastic therapist and he has never once judged told you. me what I need to do. He suggested things. That's nice. You know, or yeah, he's never judged me. He's just a normal dude that went to school for this and knows a lot more about how to help people than I do. Well, true. It's probably like Dr. Sandra Lee, Dr. Pimple Popper, MD. Your case is probably not the worst they've seen. No, and you can't <laughs> pop that nub on your own. Correct. Because you're going to leave a big-ass hole in your shoulder. She said it's very dangerous when people try yeah. to do it on their own. And there's a huge crater in your shoulder. Yeah. you got to get that shit sewn up. Go to her. You don't do it yourself. So no DIY help. Go go get help. Yes, exactly. Six months after being released from Green Oaks, Thomas showed up on the doorstep of his cousin's house, where his second cousin and friend, Elijah, was living as well. Please forgive me. Thomas said when Elijah opened the door. I sold my soul to the devil. Elijah told Thomas it was late and he needed to get some rest. Thomas left, only to return later that night to speak to Elijah's father, Roderick, where he insisted that he must deliver Elijah to the crucifixion. Oh, he did. I, Roderick said, get out of here. He's asleep. Well, then there was kind of a ruckus. So Elijah turns the light on and he's like, he's not asleep. He's up there right now. And Roderick's like, I'm not going to let you yeah. crucify my son. Lee. No. Yeah. It's so tricky because someone show your family member shows up and does that. You probably don't want to call the police because that means you're going to be getting your uh, not arrested but they're going to be taken somewhere they don't want to go and their family and you feel like you're doing them a disservice it's the same thing with addicts yes you enable them because well you, you love them and you, you love them and you don't want to see them struggling or homeless and everything but if you've watched any episode of intervention you know that addicts will not get better until they hit rock bottom and it's up to the family to kind of force that rock bottom just let them you know tough love yeah you have you can't give them money you can't give them a place to stay because no one is going to get better until they have nowhere else to go but up yes if they know someone is always there to pick up the pieces they're not as inclined to get better yeah which is I don't know if the same thing applies in these mental health situations. I think it's up to the family to support them and try and get them help. But again, 
if the person in need is denying that help, there's only so much you can do. That's true. I mean, I guess you call if it was any other person came to your house and said they want to crucify your you kid, would call the cops. Call the cops. Absolutely. So just kind of treat it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Thomas's father next attempted to bring a doctor and social worker to Thomas, but claims Linda Thomas's mother wouldn't allow him to be taken to a facility. So here we kind of see that while pretty much everyone in his life is really trying their damnedest to get him help. His mother is is not sold on it. She's a little bit in denial. She and she's in denial. I think there's also that stigma of mental health problems with yes. her there. There's probably also something as a mother that you're like if if I can't help my son then no one else can. True. And also a sense of pride and yes, she's already like been she's already been betrayed and feels like They've kind of pulled the rug out from underneath her with the Earhart family, mm -hmm. and she doesn't want her son. She lost him once. She doesn't want yes, him exactly. Again. Be taken away again, or to feel like she's not a good enough mother to help him on her own. And th where did I go wrong? Why yeah. is he acting like Lots this? Lots of where did I go wrong? Why didn't we go to church more? Why didn't I study the Bible yes. more? Whatever. And the reality is, she did nothing wrong. This is a chemical imbalance in his brain. Yeah, it's like I said. It's always any mental health issue. It's like. If you're, you know, you're born and you have a skin disorder. I have eczema. My parents didn't do anything wrong to give no. me eczema. You know, it's yeah. like, it, it is. I so suffer I'm allergic from to depression yeah. and anxiety. No one did anything wrong. They didn't do that to you. Yeah. No. Yeah. So and it just is. And it's part of like self-love and mm -hmm. accepting yourself mm -hmm. and saying, I'm not broken. I just am. Yep. And then this is the thing that's going to help me go forward. Exactly. Well, Linda denies this ever occurred, but is also skeptical about Thomas's diagnosis. They threw around schizophrenia. I, I don't know. I don't know much about it. I think it was something else going on that was mind altering. In, in some form or fashion, his mind had been altered. That's a good question, too, is yeah. if the K2 exacerbated the symptoms of the schizophrenia. I don't know. I mean, I think probably because she was such a devout Christian that religion played into it a lot, too, of thinking if we just pray harder, if we just go to church more, then everything will work itself out. Damn. God will find a way. There is nothing wrong if you're a Christian and you believe in God, when you refuse help or deny help of others because of stuff like that, that's to me when it becomes a problem. It's harmful. It's like the freedom of religion. You're free to practice your religion until unless and until it negatively impacts or injures yes. someone else, you know, like you see families that are of the religion where they re will refuse all medication or, or any refuse kind of medical intervention. Blood transfusion. Yes. And then their five-year-old kid dies because they refuse to take him to the hospital. Yes. And then the, that gets into a sticky question of mm -hmm. like, they ha it's the parent's right to refuse a blood transfusion. Does that mean little Jimmy's going to die? In some cases, yes. So, And, and then that's a, with a kid, it's the question of consent. I mean, here he's 18. You yeah. know I mean? He's old, old yeah. enough. Well, after officially withdrawing from A&M in 2012 and showing no interest in enrolling at another school or getting a job, Thomas began walking. A lot. Some walks would last upwards of an entire day. His aunt asked him why he walked so much, and he told her, The voices in my head won't stop. I think that's a pretty common thing. It's, it's similar with OCD. You're doing any kind of repetitive behavior to just... Try to mitigate. Yes. Try and, and just quell the... The madness that you're it's, feeling. I think I feel, I'm trying to remember where I was or in what context it was that there was an audio experience where you put on headphones and it was meant to simulate schizophrenia. Oh God! And it's just like whispers and it's, so it's not like someone's going, "Hello, Thomas, do these things." No, it's more like, "Yeah, it's a crucifixion." And you're like, "Wait, what?" And you it feel made, like you're. Like you're in an echo chamber yeah, and there's like, people in there, and it's not multiple personality disorder. No, but it in is, fact, that's a good point. There's a. A lot of people get these two things mixed up yes. and they're it's schizophrenia is not the same thing as multiple personality disorder at all. So in schizophrenia, you have a little bit of trouble with reality, too. Yeah. So if you're walking down the street and someone says, hey, buddy, you think, was that in my head? Was that a yeah. person? Are you real? Are you in a hallucination? Delusions part of and hallucination are a big part. Oh, of it, oh, yeah. what? Um, Slender Man, the Slender Man. Um, documentary oh, yes, yes. on the HBO. Girl has schizophrenia and her father did as her well. Her father did and mm -hmm. it's the dad is talking about what it's like and he yeah. said I'm driving down the road and I look in my rearview mirror and Satan is sitting in my backseat yeah. just as clear as you're sitting here talking to me. And he knows it's not there. And he's like I know it's not there but I'm still so scared. Yeah. And if Satan's like you have to drive your car off the road you're like you're not real and it's like oh I am yeah. real. And so I mean it's just so hard to deal with. So one of the biggest ways my anxiety manifests itself is mm -hmm. a thing called catastrophizing mm -hmm. which is where I, for example, I've talked like if Tommy leaves the house, my brain immediately goes to 
what was the last thing we said? He's probably going to get into a car wreck and die. I'm never going to see him again. I'm going to be raising Ella by myself. It just becomes this like snowball effect that, mm-hmm. that happens. So when that happens, and I've discussed this in therapy, my body reacts as if it's really happening because wow. your brain doesn't understand that this isn't really happening. It's just reacting to the stress that your body feels. And if you're envisioning yourself and Ella mm-hmm. is 10 years old suddenly and mm-hmm. there's no Tommy and there hasn't been, you're having a physiological yes. reaction yeah. to that. Think wow. if you, if you put, I mean, think about any s- scary situation mm-hmm. and it hasn't happened. You're just imagining this happening. Like a nightmare. Your heart rate starts to increase. Mm-hmm. Your palms get sweaty. You feel, and that's because your body doesn't understand you're not really experiencing. I scream this. myself away because I think something's yeah. attacking me. Yeah. So it's the same thing like that guy's just Describing. He yes. knows it's not really happening, but his body and his brain are reacting as if it really is happening. Yes. And that's the type of stress that you you then start to feel. Yeah. It's very exhausting. And, that's what, and then it becomes a panic attack. It becomes a whole thing. Yes. So, I mean, it's that's the importance of therapy and medication mm-hmm. is managing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, in April of 2014, Thomas decided he wanted to go back to College Station, but found himself without a car. He then went to his aunt's house, where she ran an in-home daycare. And after smashing a window to snatch the keys, stole her Chevy van and drove to his former college town. When his aunt returned home later and called the police, the security footage showed Thomas pacing around with a knife and looking nervously out the window. So since she had an in-home daycare, she had indoor cameras, Mm -hmm. too. So he smashed the window, gets in, pulls a knife out of her. Thank God the kids weren't there. Thank God. Yeah, she wasn't there and the kids weren't there. Pulls a knife out of the kitchen and is just walking around the kitchen with a knife. Probably completely unaware of what he's doing. I think he put the knife down and then stole the van. Yeah, yeah. When he arrived at College Station, his demeanor was just as aggressive. He showed up to the football practice complex and begged the coach to let him back on the team. The coach said Thomas was looking bad and offered to get him help. At that suggestion, Thomas got aggressive and the coach threw him out of the complex. No longer welcome at A&M, Thomas headed back to Dallas. As he passed through Waco, a cop happened to run the van's plates, and when it came up as stolen... Thomas was arrested and taken to Dallas County Jail, where he served three months. That's a long time. Is yeah. It? Well, three months for stealing. I bet. Because that would mean that his aunt would have had to have said, yeah, he stole it. Um, and you know what? I wonder if there was any damage to it, if she had to file a police report for like insurance purposes and you feel bad and you're like, I know. who." Or they it. were like, at least we know he he's can't locked. harm himself he or others keep if him he's away. in jail. Yeah, it's true. So he he. For this charge, he serves the three months and then gets out on supervised release. After his release, a sports marketing executive, Dave Stevenson, who was familiar with Thomas from his time at Skyline High School, stepped in. He bailed Thomas out of jail and introduced him to a pastor who helped him develop a care plan that included working out, Bible study, and sessions with a psychologist. This guy is trying to blindside. He's trying to do. Yeah, a this is a real Sandra Bullock moment. This right is a white here. savior blindside yeah. guy. And they basically Who again is is going to use religion. However, at least he's going to also be seeing a psychologist, hopefully, and doing some other things. Ideally, again, there's no problem with religion, but if you have medical mental health problems. No amount of praying is going to do make you any better. But you know what you can do? There are it's on their websites. There are Christian counselors yes. that are Go licensed a, yes. therapists, social workers, whatever. You can still have if that is important to you, you can have that aspect faith of faith based yes, counseling. while still getting the actual like medical attention correct. that you need. There's faith based like, doctors, correct. physicians and and all sorts of things. That yeah. respect that, you know. Mm-hmm. And also this was a diversion program, so he wasn't convicted. I think he was arrested, was serving, waiting, and then as part of a plea deal, yeah. you like plead no contest, you get in this diversion program and you say for ninety days or however long, I'll keep my nose clean mm-hmm. and I'll check in and I'll do these things. Thomas lived with Stevenson and his family on their sprawling farm 50 miles outside of Dallas, where he worked out, worked, trained, and had sessions with a special consultant to make sure Thomas would become NCAA eligible. So they're also trying to get him back into football. football. Yeah, correct. But before Thomas could have his first session with the psychologist, Thomas announced to the Stevensons that he and his mother decided he should leave the farm. Leaving the farm meant Thomas would violate the terms of his diversion program, but Thomas didn't care. So again, we have, I don't want to lose my son. You're not going to go live with this family. This rich white family has come in. Again. Again, swooped him up, and I feel completely betrayed and alone. This poor woman, I can't even put myself in her shoes. That has to be an... 
horrible feeling. Not to mention her son is struggling and she has doesn't really know how to help. She's him. powerless. Yeah, yeah. To stop what's going on in his head. Thomas went for an overnight visit to his mother. But when the Stevensons called to pick him back up, Thomas's mother said he was gone and she didn't know where he was. Thomas had decided to walk 20 miles to Duncanville to apologize to his aunt for stealing her van. But when he arrived, his horrifying appearance and darting eyes convinced his aunt he was a danger to the children in her daycare. She put the place on lockdown and called the police. You have to. I oh, mean, yeah. you're in charge of kids. Come I on. mean, there's contracts and stuff those parents have probably signed that uh, force you to do something like that. Uh, yeah. When the police arrived, Thomas acted confused. Before the officers could arrest him, he walked away, then sprinted away before being caught and was arrested a second time, this time for evading arrest. So he's starting on this rock bottom that we talked about, yeah. this downward spiral. He's already he's out on his broken his diversion program, so it's probably inevitably about to have a warrant. Now he's make, being sort of menacing, threatening. Yeah. Who knows what he said to the aunt? Then when they try to arrest him, if you run off, you, know, you just got another charge for evading Don't run from the cops. I mean, it, we can hopefully okay. Diversion. Side note: mm -hmm. I watched all of When They See Us. Um, oh, I haven't been able to bring myself to see it yet. Just, I want to tell you, I've heard is watched it on the way there. I wept so hard. Watched it on the way to New York. Watched it on the on my iPad on the way to New York. The guy next to me was asleep. I cried so hard that he woke up. <laughs> God, he starts digging in his bag and I'm thinking maybe he's going to get headphones. He digs in his bag and he pulls out Southwest drink coupons and he goes, I think you need these more than me. Oh, that's so, <laughs> so nice. nice. Did, he, like, did he ask what was wrong? No, he didn't know what was wrong. I was just, I mean, I was. You know what? Good on him. It's none of his business. He was just like, you know what? I'm going to help this lady out. It was very nice. That is. Did you use them? I use them on the way back because it was nice. the flight was almost over and I was just I was just crying so hard. Yeah. And then on the way back, I rode back with Austin Guttery, who is uh, one of my comedy partners. And he was on, he had on his headphones and was kind of half asleep, half awake. And I was watching the last, you know, half of episode two and three. And, you know, I was finishing it up. <laughs> I was, again, crying so hard that Austin just woke up and went, are you going to this is kind of intense to watch on the plane. Are you going to be OK? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'll be fine. I said, it's just injustice. You don't understand. <laughs> so we're going to have to do an episode on that or probably two or three yeah. episodes on it, because it is just as a lawyer, one of the scenes that made me cry the most is there's a moment when one the prosecutor, Vera Vermiglia, who's like actually prosecuting it, I think is, is, is it this cool? about the Central Park Five? Yes. Yeah. Well, this, the exonerated five is what. OK. Um, and so because Central Park Five was kind of thrust on them by the yeah, media yeah, yeah. and to sort of make them faceless. So the yeah. exonerated five. And so one lawyer is talking to the other and the one is having this kind of the one that's really pushing it. The shitty one, Linda Fairstein, is kind of pushing this narrative. And Vera Famiglia's character just goes, you know, I, I don't know that I can do this. I don't, I, I'm not sure. And she's, it's this moment where things could have taken a turn. Mm -hmm. And Linda Fairstein's like, you have to go out there. You have to do it. And it just made me cry because that is the purpose of a lawyer is mm -hmm. to say no. Yeah. That in the face of something like this, you say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to stop it. And she didn't. And I was like, you fucking failure. And I just cried. Yeah. I mean, I, I cried. I mean, for like we were just saying, you hire people that are professionals to help you with things. Yes. They put their trust in these in that woman and she totally fucked them over well and in the defense attorney played by joshua jackson there's a scene none of this is spoilers there's a scene too where uh he's he's antron mccray's attorney and this particularly damning test not damning but like testimony that doesn't go well for them and antron just sort of goes hey, he's a little boy and he just goes yeah. hey you did what you could and josh jackson goes hey buddy it's not over yet and i just lost mm. it i mean oh man and when, i mean oh god i can't i've heard from everyone that it is very 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 hard to watch it's mandatory viewing yeah though. but also watch. it's like it's like 13 it's you th yes you have to watch it and yeah. then there's an oprah special afterwards too that's really good oh, that interviews everybody but i bet that's fantastic it's just a lot yeah yeah <laughs> it's very it's a lot. Just... don't watch it on a plane i watched no. million dollar baby on a red eye to vegas once oh, for a bachelorette God. party <laughs> What was I thinking? Bad choice. Also, glued to the little TV in front of me, but sobbing uncontrollably. I, I watched Bo Burn on one of his specials, and I was laughing so hard I was crying, and I went up to go to the bathroom, and this grandma next to me just goes, I have to know what you're watching. You just seem like you're having such a ball. It's like, I don't think you're going to like this grandma. <laughs> hey, you don't know. Maybe. She might be a little turned up grandma. <laughs> well, the next few months did not go well for Thomas. First, he tested positive for marijuana, a violation of his probation. Then he missed an appointment with his probation officer, failed to pay $640 in court costs, and neglected to enroll in a safe neighborhoods program. In January of 2015, 
He appeared before a Dallas County magistrate on the evasion charge, but he was treated like just another drug addict with a low-level rap sheet. Thomas was sentenced to a six-month stay in a drug rehabilitation center rather than sentence him to jail. So he's not a drug addict. God, no, he's smoking weed. He's smoking weed to probably quell the voices yeah, in his head. Yeah, he's self-medicating. Yes, and he does not need to be in jail or in a drug facility. He needs to be in a fucking mental yes. hospital to so someone can help him manage these symptoms. Absolutely. And in jail, they will administer medication, but they ain't going to make sure you're taking it. And they're not going to give you therapy no. and they're not going to give you behavioral. They're just trying to keep everybody from killing each other. Yes, pretty much. Upon his release, Thomas's demeanor had completely changed again. Where previously he had been angered fairly easily, now he was on a hair trigger. Even more upsetting, he confessed to his mother, father, his aunt, and two of his closest friends that on the evening after the Alabama game in November of 2012, he was raped. Thomas's roommate at the time recalls the post-Alabama game celebration differently, saying that everyone was happy Thomas went out with them since he usually just stayed in his room. And that they all had a good time. Yeah, apparently his family member said he was attacked, assaulted, raped, sexually assaulted. He kind but nothing's of, come out saying who did this. Correct. And he wouldn't. He didn't make any reports, which is, I mean, that's actually a thing that happens to people. Oh, yeah. That doesn't mean it didn't happen not, Exactly. Not even a little bit. But, and that's what A&M kind of said. Well, we didn't hear anything of it. It's oh, like, oh, okay. I'm sure you didn't. Yeah. I'm sure you probably didn't hear the millions of other rapes right, that probably exactly. happened on your campus and every other college campus. Yeah. But his... Aunt said, his aunt Brenda, he, who he had apparently told that I, I was raped to, she said he just, something happened and he just could not handle it. And that really sort of sent him. So down it was the hard spiral. to know if it did happen, if it, if he was having a, a manic episode or a schizophrenic episode and he thought that it had happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I hesitate to say he was making it up. Correct. I think it either really did happen or he thought that it, he was convinced it had happened, whether it actually happened or not. Or something happened, whether or not it was something like, traumatic, happened. something traumatic happened. And he, yeah. his, his aunt said he could not handle it. Thomas ended up moving in with his mother and unfortunately was still not getting the help he needed for his mental health. On October 10th, 2015, Thomas and his mother watched War Room, a film about prayer. The two enjoyed their time together as Linda watched Thomas laugh at the film's funny parts. At the end of the movie, around 9.30 p.m., Thomas announced he was going out. When Linda woke up the next morning to go to church, she found Thomas was not there. Just as she was about to leave, Thomas came home, completely enraged, and began cursing at his mother. Linda did not take this well and told Thomas that after she had stood by him through everything, she would not be cursed out in her own home. Thomas then grabbed a long-bladed knife and stormed out. That is such a hard scene to think about that yeah. she's had a great night with them. They were having fun. He's in a good mood. He's laughing and then just comes home and is a completely different mm -hmm. person. And that's schizophrenia. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Who knows what happened to him on that from 930 p.m. to at, this was approximately 6 a.m. Yeah. Or 7 a.m. When she no one knows where up. he was, who he was with, mm -hmm. what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Wandering around, walking, yeah. walking all night. Yeah. Walking. Maybe. Uh, hurting himself, possibly trying to hurt others. I'm telling what upsetting thoughts are going through his head. Yes. So it's it's hard for her as a mom, too, to say you, it's the shell of your boy. You know, yeah. it's your kid. Yeah. But then they're saying all these things that's not what you're used to, not what you would expect, and not, frankly, it's like, not what you want to hear. It's like uh, the invasion of the body snatchers. Yes. Someone else has come in and taken over Occupied. your son's yes. body. Yeah. It's got to be so traumatic for oh, her, too. Oh, my gosh. And then to see him grab a knife and sort of, I mean, mm -hmm. what is she, and he's, he's a big guy. Yeah. And she's an older woman. She can't stop him. I'm sure she was fearing for her own life. Dave Stevens, an accomplished marathoner with 11 finishes under his belt, had loved running his entire life. He had dedicated himself to the sport, running Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays like clockwork. His wife of 25 years, Patty, would sometimes accompany him. He would run ahead, then loop back around to keep an eye on her fearful of her running alone this is me running with any guy <laughs> like just, you're looping back to get them no they're now. running oh. back to get me no i don't run i don't run with guys although in uh college my freshman year of college a guy did ask me to go on a date with him for a run and i was oh at the god well i was in the best shape of my life at the time and i said yes nevertheless i was in new orleans i was sweating i'm just drenched and at yeah. the end of it he just was like i i'll, I'll call you and <laughs> I'll i was like no you. you're not gonna call me i'm drenched in sweat if anyone ever asked me on a date to work out 
It's gross. It's rude. Uh, I mean, we would, that relationship would end right we, there. We clearly don't have anything in common. <laughs> I'm going to go. Bye. Yeah. I'm going to go. I'd run right to the nearest Uber and just Uber back to my house. But this speaks to Davy's suite. He would go back oh, and make sure, sure. she's safe. Yeah. At age 53, Dave was an accomplished engineer at General Electric, admired by his coworkers for his simple, elegant designs. He was quiet, but witty and well-liked. Planning for an early retirement, Dave had begun looking at farmland in Oregon so he and his wife, Patty, could move up there and raise livestock. That sounds wonderful. It sounds so peaceful. It does. On October 12th, 2015, around 7 a.m., Dave put his wallet into the glove box of his SUV and set off to run along the flat, less used White Rock Creek path in North Dallas near Walnut Hill Lane. He planned to run about 90 minutes in preparation for the Dallas Marathon, which was just eight weeks away. Along his intended path was Harry Moss Park, a lush, tree-lined park that extends beneath the Walnut Hill overpass. So for those of you not from Dallas, Dallas has a lake called White Rock Lake. It's a man-made reservoir. We have a whole episode, Lady of the Lake, where we tell the history of it. And there's a 10-mile trail around White Rock Lake, but there are six or seven feeder trails. Offshoots, yeah. Offshoots, Santa Fe Trail, and then the White Rock Creek uh, path being Mm -hmm. one of them. That you can either run those paths on their own, or if you run long enough, you'll end up on the White Rock Trail. Yeah, they all intersect at some point. So it's all named after this lake. Mm Mm-hmm. At 7.32 a.m., a pedestrian walking near the Walnut Hill Lane Bridge spotted what he described as a huge, crazed man wearing a hoodie near some tennis courts. He defensively pulled out a can of pepper spray and called 911. He said during the call that Johnson was following a jogger who noticed and began running faster. Good God. That's, this is the nightmare I had. This, this is, exact scene. You were the guy I was that saw this? The, on the phone and then uh, the crime happened and then the perp turns and starts walking towards me. We've talked before how your gut tells you when something just ain't right. Yes. And we've all seen people that were like, that person looks a little sketchy. But for this guy to pull out pepper spray and then call 911 when all this all Thomas is doing right now is just standing there. I thought he was was he not pacing back and forth? Okay, even if he's pacing, but you're like I mean, we live in East Dallas. How many times do you see something like this going yes. on and you don't call the cops? No. But something went off in his in his brain that was like this is not normal. Yeah. Because I- like we've said your body emits that oh that, that oh, pheromone that pheromone when you're about to do something dangerous and i think at the trial there were the witnesses said that he was whispering to himself or talking to himself uh, behaving in an abnormal fashion yeah. that that maybe he was on a cell phone but not they could kind of tell that I he see wasn't this behavior that's true every damn day in east dallas not gonna lie i walk around talking to myself constantly <laughs> like at i mean the go, office. go i was in downtown dallas today and saw this yeah you know i mean this is unfortunately this is something that goes on quite a bit because we, if you live in a big city and there's a homeless population True. that aren't getting the mental health help that they need, but this guy called 911 and unfortunately it didn't matter. It's 7.55 a.m. A cyclist phoned 911 to report a man who looked like he was hacking at the ground, almost like he was chopping wood. However, as the cyclist got closer to the grisly scene, he saw that the man in fact had a machete and was repeatedly striking a person who was lying face down on the ground. Can you just imagine? I can't. Yeah. they These people, the witnesses were deeply troubled. I mean, something like this affects not only the immediate family of the person you've murdered and their their family, everyone that saw this that day, the first responders, the people that walked up and saw this the people that called 911 their lives are forever changed absolutely because of this it's co- i mean it's just for the rest of their lives mm-hmm. they're gonna just have that feeling in parks or have that i mean you just don't i'm know. sure not a day goes by where he doesn't think they don't about think that about scene. that yeah before police could respond to that call thomas was already walking down the path and asking a dallas parks and rec employee to borrow a cell phone after calmly dialing 911 he told the dispatcher there's a man laying down with a sword in his head and not moving The employee thought Johnson was being helpful at first, but grew suspicious once he noticed the splattered blood on Johnson's pants and skin 
as Johnson stood there, hollow and expressionless. The Parks and Rec employee testified at the trial and just said, you know, at first I thought, oh, that's, that's nice. He wants to... Well, because you wouldn't imagine then that you somebody that just down. did this would come up and ask to call it in. Because he left the murder weapon with the victim mm-hmm. and just walks over. And then, when you, I mean, can you imagine that realization when you look down and go, keep the phone. I'm yeah. good. And... You're then standing face to face with someone who's just create, committed a heinous murder. Violent act. Yeah. And yeah, you're thinking, am I going to be next? What do I do? Yes. What's, I mean, they don't train you for that at the Dallas Parks and Recs, no. I'm going to imagine. No. Thomas went back to wait for the police by Dave Stevens' body. He told the first officer who arrived, I just committed capital murder. The officer asked Johnson what he meant, and he replied, It's like when you don't wake up. Dave was in his running clothes, having left his wallet and cell phone in his car. Due to the extent of his injuries, his face was almost obliterated and unrecognizable, making it impossible for police to know who he was or who they should contact. When Dave didn't come home that day and news had spread of the attack at White Rock Creek Trail, Dave's wife, Patty, became worried. The first responders... This is my nightmare. Well, as you say, it's the first responders were looking around at cars to try mm-hmm. to figure out what parked cars, but there's a ton of parked cars there. He had they, no identification on him. Nothing on him, and which you don't. I mean, no. when you're a runner. But also they said t- that Thomas Johnson, the other witnesses at the trial, said he stood there like he was waiting for his friends. Like he was like, <whistles> just kind of looking just around and just hanging out, up. waiting for the cops to come. Patty called police stations all day. Until finally receiving the news she feared. Dave was, in fact, the victim in the attack. That is your worst nightmare come to life. When you see something on the news and think, huh. Yeah. That's where my husband runs. Yeah. And he hasn't been home all day and he didn't go to work. And yeah. Yeah. She agreed to give an interview to the Dallas Morning News a week later. When asked what she liked about Dave when they first met, Patty became flustered and said he was quiet, polite. He was always a gentleman. He basically let me have everything I ever wanted. The two had been married for 25 years and had no children. They were, by all accounts, deeply in love and best friends. When asked what was next for Patty, she became choked up and said, I'll just say Dave was the love of my life and I'm lost without him. Less than a week later, Patty spread several photos of herself and Dave on their dining room table. Getting emotional. I know. <laughs> this, this, this makes me cry. Thinking about it makes me cry. Less than a week later, Patty spread several photos of herself and Dave on their dining room table. She shut the garage door, turned on her SUV, then lied on the ground beside the exhaust pipe. I can't even imagine. Can you just imagine? No. That stuff, like, really, really gets to me. Well, and her life was completely upended, and they didn't have children. They were, she was... That was all she... That was, was, I mean, she had family, I'm sure, but this was everything she knew. It's the love of her life, and they were going to go, they were going to get their farm in Oregon, you know? And again, you have no idea, like when he left that morning. I love you. It was an every day... Have a good run, I love you. She would have never thought, like, that was the last time she was going to see him. And not just not see him, but, like, to be... Literally, His life ended in the most like brutal way no, one could imagine. Never, like she couldn't see him again because you couldn't recognize yeah, him. That's true. Yeah. Thomas Johnson had immediately confessed and turned himself in. His attorneys argued that he was mentally incompetent to stand trial. In Texas, a person is incompetent to stand trial if the person does not have one sufficient present ability to consult with the person's lawyer with a reasonable degree of rational understanding or two a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings against the person. So basically, if they're at trial and they have no idea that they're at trial, they can't tell you. They say, I'm the king of England. And I, I mean, yeah. they have no grasp on reality or if they don't understand what that what they've done is wrong. And that's sort of like the what is the of mice and men, the Lenny and the rabbit thing? Like, I yeah. didn't know what I was. I just was trying to I, I didn't think it they would die. I yeah. had no, you know, yeah. that kind of. But it's not for this situation. But I think at this point he was pretty uh, he, he was pretty far into his delusions. Mm-hmm. And so he did not at the time at this time of arrest necessarily. He knew he had committed a crime, but I don't think he was. Well, at the time he knew he'd committed capital he I, murder. Yeah, he committed murder. straight up told the police that. Yeah. And, and, and the argument later, and we'll see here in the trial, is that if 
normally it comes from you don't know right from wrong and he right. said call 911 so it's like you knew you did he something knew wrong. he had done yeah. something wrong and that he needed he knew the proper protocol in this situation is to call 911 yeah six months after his arrest a magistrate ruled that thomas johnson was mentally incompetent to stand trial he was sent to a mental hospital for 120 days of treatment in an effort to regain his competency he was tested again in may of 2017 and the court found that based on the medical witnesses he was still incompetent to stand trial when he was tested a third time in june 2018 a judge found that following his treatment johnson's competency was restored however in advance of trial his attorneys filed a notice to the court that Johnson planned to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Since Johnson had confessed to police, his attorneys planned on demonstrating that at the time of the incident, Johnson did not understand right from wrong. So how can they argue that when they they're 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 saying we recognize our client called to say I just committed a capital murder, but they're also saying he didn't know that that was wrong? I wonder if well here's the thing when you there's you're dealing with criminal law there's two portions of a criminal law well you have something like strict liability where you're just you like run a stop sign you don't have to yeah. be like well i didn't know what it, that's just the thing you did or speeding you know you're just you just did the crime when you get into stuff like murder where you have to prove intent or maliciousness there's the actus reus which is the action that creates the crime so the physical injury to the person and then the mens rea which is the mental component of the mm -hmm. crime and the mens rea is usually at the moment that you're doing it and immediately preceding it. So I think their argument was that he thinks he's Jesus. He thinks he's defeating some sort of evil being or something mm -hmm. like that at the time. And then post act, he stands up and goes, Oh shit. What did I do? He's lucid again. I need to call 911. I've just done a crime. Interesting. So I think that was the argument was that he has this outburst with his mother at 6 30 in the morning mm -hmm. or seven ends up walking or somehow taking transit ends up at this park thinking he's on this mission mm -hmm. and he doesn't know that he's not slaying a dragon that he's actually murdering a person right but then post act that's whenever he big reality like I said, clicked back in lucidity sets in and he says oh god i need to call 911 but I mean, arguably, his demeanor hadn't changed before, and I, I mean that the job witnesses the, said he was the, the same. The cyclist said saw, yeah, that he was sort of just ma very matter of fact at yeah. everything. So yeah, they call That's, it flat effect. Yes, when there's just zero uh, expression on someone that suffers from schizophrenia, their face they don't show yes. emotions the way someone that doesn't have schizophrenia would show emotion. Agreed. When a defendant in Texas pleads insanity, they are effectively admitting to the actions that constitute the alleged offense, but also arguing that they should not be held criminally responsible. Under Texas law, the insanity defense requires a defendant to provide evidence of a mental disease or defect that rendered them incapable of knowing that their conduct was wrong. So that would be classic if, in fact, he thought he was Jesus or Eli or whatever, and he's defeating some sort of evil creature. And he says, I didn't know I was killing a person. I mm -hmm. thought I was or I thought it was a bush or a cloud or something, then that's the argument. That's whenever you plead not guilty by reason of insanity. So incompetent, competency to stand trial and then not guilty by reason of insanity are two different things. Because if you're incompetent to stand trial, you basically get locked up at a mental facility until you're competent. Right. And then if you're found competent to stand trial, then that's where we're at now. And then this is his plea. Is that, yes, I, there were witnesses. They saw me do this physical act. I'm not saying I didn't do it. I'm saying I didn't know what I was that doing. Me, and you have to prove the mens rea and the actus reus. You, you have to prove the mental part and the physical part. He's uh, admitting to the physical part. But right. then if you can't prove the mental part, that's when you say you you can't prove the components of a crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Because murder is not the unlawful killing with another. It's like the unlawful killing of another with malice of forethought. Right. So that's where you get into the grades of murder and manslaughter. Johnson's attorneys had a tough time arguing this, considering their client called 911 immediately after the incident and also said to the arresting officer, I have committed capital murder. These statements indicate that Johnson knew precisely what he was doing. The fact that supposed voices in his head were encouraging him does not play into the insanity defense. Because if a voice in your head says, you need to go and kill someone, and you go and kill someone, you have the mental, you still have the mens rea that you know you're taking a someone's life wrongfully. Right. So that's wh where the, the kind of nuance kind of comes into this. 
It's a real sticky situation. It's real. It's very nuanced. And it's when you're on a jury, that's your job, though. I mean, yeah. for everybody that's like, I want to get out of jury duty. I get it. It sucks. It's six dollars a day. I like jury I duty. Love, I mean, I would love it. But I I get it. And if you really genuinely have to care for a child or an ailing parent yeah. or you'll get fired from your job, which is illegal. But you know what I mean? I get it if you want to get out of it. But I think it's your honor and your privilege as a citizen mm-hmm. to serve and to listen because yeah. you are the your rationale and reasoning is you're the person that's going to help this family absolutely and it is an honor and a privilege. it's an honor and a privilege I to do it i 100 agree with that several witnesses testified to johnson's demeanor at the time of the incident with one calling him pure evil and another describing him as hollow and as if he were waiting for his friends to come along so that the attorneys were trying to argue that that was part of it, that, well, if he really knew what he did, he'd be freaking out. Yeah. He'd be sad. But like you said, this is the flat affect yeah. that is a, a, a product of his mental Ill- illness. Over the course of the three day trial, Johnson's attorney repeatedly asked witnesses if he seemed like he had a mental illness, still insisting that their client was not aware of his actions. The defense presented no witnesses, instead relying on the insanity argument. In the end, the jury took less than 30 minutes to convict Johnson of first-degree murder. The next day, the jury sentenced him to life in prison for the act, deliberating for less than two hours. So this was pretty cut and dry for the jury. I think so. And I think that there were – the witnesses were so convincing that there were eyewitnesses to the incident. And it's such a brutal and heinous act that the victim, Dave – was a complete just wrong wrong place wrong time situation yes, innocent g- yeah guy. There, no one could say a bad thing about this guy to no. even make it seem like it's not self-defense it yeah, wasn't a yeah. fight it wasn't yeah no. yeah he, he was, was just doing it, his thing he, yeah he was living his life yeah he was living his life and so i think that the the jury was particularly convinced by this the parade of witnesses who were at the scene at the time that said yeah. he very calmly, he knew what he was doing. He clearly walked over, did the thing, turned around and said, Hey, I need to use your phone and yeah. tell someone I just did something. Yeah. So I think that was what maybe helped the jury along too. And then, you know, you, the, when you get into someone who's, not fully present or potentially not fully present like say someone gets drunk or gets really really high on cocaine and kills people Mm -hmm. the mens rea the mental state culpability comes in when you decided to get super drunk or you decided to do cocaine Mm. or you decided not to go get help for your schizophrenia Mm -hmm. so your culpability starts way back when you know so i think that was also convincing to them that he's got this mental illness he's that been he's denying help for years will, willfully not yes uh willfully not taking care of yeah defense attorney paul johnson no relation to thomas conceded that thomas johnson refused to take his medication in which case he said what else can you do but keep him away from people and that pretty much sums it up i think so and in, and this is a, like a super tragic case which is why we both get so choked up and have nightmares and cry about it and think about i mean i it's it's such a tough case because it's there's no winners. No, no. There's no justice for the family. There's no justice for his family. I mean, it's just on all accounts. On all accounts, everyone. And also probably could have been prevented. That's the other thing that I wonder, too. And there's no – you can't ever blame someone for someone else's actions, right? Sure. However – I think we all have a responsibility to our fellow person to when we see something, do as much as we can to perhaps mitigate these issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that for poor Thomas Johnson, and I do say that he's a murderer, right? Right. He's a heinous murderer. However, at one point, he was like a 14-year-old kid that had this. Yeah. And a 15-year-old kid and a 16-year-old kid Mm -hmm. that had this that struggled that – I believe not necessarily by his parents, but at least these outside people who his coaches, I'm sure, loved him. And the rich families that tried to blindside him. And I'm using that as a verb now. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Loved him. But I also think that that what really throws a wrench in your plan to have an NFL player be your surrogate son would be if he had a mental illness. Yeah. And you say, well, just don't tell people that you hear things. His aunt said, oh, he's and." She said when he was a little bit older, I think it was after he had left A&M, they were at a family party and he was sitting in a chair, looking at an empty chair, talking to the empty chair, yeah. having a full conversation. And she goes, what are you doing, buddy? And he's like, I'm in the middle of a conversation. And she's like, oh, OK, like there were Just something that everyone knew about, but chose to turn the other cheek. He'll and be fine. Rush under the rug. He'll be fine. He'll be it fine. It was one of those things that 
I mean, it's in a lot of families, like the, you know, the aunt you don't talk about. Yes. Or, you know, I mean, the it's wacky just, cousin, the yes, wacky aunt, black sheep yeah. of the family. Yeah. When they are crying out for help. And it's they, not funny. It's not funny. It's not a bit to say, oh, that's crazy Uncle Marty yeah. or whatever. You're like, no, maybe crazy Uncle Marty really genuinely needs a yes. professional help. And if they don't get it, they could Destroy. do something that destroys tons of people's lives yes. in an instant. Well, when interviewed after the sentencing came down. Thomas's dad, Robert, told reporters, I'm at a loss for words. My heart is torn in so many different directions for the family that was impacted by what happened. It was not my son. It was schizophrenia. There's a video of him doing this interview mm, and rough. he's just he's got his sunglasses on because he's crying so hard. Yeah. And I, but I think they're ha they're happy that he's going to be somewhere. Hopefully that he can get help. I know. And like, yeah, like I'm Paul sure there's Johnson a bit said, of relief that he's kept going away. to be in, in a facility now. I'm sure. And his dad tried several times to get him help. He did. He he did what he, but again, he, he said, can only do so much. There's nothing wrong, son. You know, it's, it's like a hospital. Just go in. It's a hospital. Yeah. And he said, no, dad, I want my, I don't want my teammates to think I'm crazy. But it all it took was maybe one person saying, you don't need to do that Yeah. to, you know, that Come. way he didn't want to do it. So if you have just one person that says it's okay, don't in listen. that corner, then that's who you're going to listen to over the 20 other people telling, you, no, you need to get help. the doctors. Yeah. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, a person generally begins to exhibit signs of schizophrenia between the ages of 16 to 30 years old. But the most common time for men is late adolescence to early adulthood. So like you said, yes, he's in 14, 15, 16 is when this he's starting to show signs of this. Mm -hmm. And that's also imagine just being a 14 year old male, female, whatever. It's hard. How, being how fucking hard that time in your life. Then you is. start getting voices or you yeah. start to see things that maybe other people don't see yes and it, and you're already isolated as a teenager you're more isolated yeah. now it's it's the formative years of your life and now something it's even worse horrible has been thrown at you not horrible because a lot of people live with schizophrenia and they take their medication have therapy and they're very successful but if you aren't getting that help and you have no idea what's going on yes i can't imagine how terrifying that must be absolutely you feel like you have nowhere to turn exactly when people hear the term schizophrenia, they tend to oversimplify the condition, associating it with the more well-known symptoms, such as delusions and hallucinations. However, there is so much more to this complicated disorder, with some studies showing that it is actually made up of eight different diseases. In addition to delusions and hallucinations, other common symptoms include the inability to express emotion or find pleasure in things, confused and disordered thinking and speak, and problems with attention, concentration, and memory. So, I mean, imagine it's like having a learning disability and mm -hmm. a mental health issue and maybe it, it impacts you socially. It does it's hard for you things. to go. Yeah. So yeah. it's just, it's just isolating you more and more. And frankly, there's people around that maybe see you as kind of like a cash cow. Yeah. Yeah, Exactly. Researchers believe that both genetics and environmental factors contribute to the onset of the disorder. And that's the other question that I was talking about this case with a friend of mine who's real into like football. And they were like, do you think there was maybe any CTE or head? Mm. You know, if you are, if you're predisposed or you do have early, you, the early onset of schizophrenia and then you start getting whacked in the head a bunch, mm -hmm. if that could have an issue impact on it and then mix that with smoking the synthetic marijuana that it's, it's not that it caused his schizophrenia, but it could exacerbate it. Might, it. it probably didn't help. Yeah. Who's the wrestler that killed his entire family and then himself? Chris Benoit. Yeah. Yes. It's, I mean, again, or, or you see football players, yeah. uh, ex football players that have been getting Tons hit in the head for so many years and then, something a mental health problem occurs or they yeah take their own life because they can't handle it schizophrenia affects less than one percent of the u.s population most people that are diagnosed are not dangerous or violent and with proper treatment live productive and rewarding lives with family in group homes or even on their own for those diagnosed with schizophrenia the support and optimism of their families is crucial Fantastic organizations such as the Schizophrenia and Related Disorders Alliance of American and Mental Health America offer resources to assist families in educating themselves on the disorder and the best practices for supporting their loved one. I think it's definitely a disease that if you're isolated, it's much worse. Yes. And to to be the parent or sister or brother or spouse or whatever of someone that has schizophrenia or any kind of mental health disorder is a very tough position to be Absolutely. in. Absolutely. You are going through your own struggles. 
apart from what the person affected with the mental health condition is going through. It's just as important for that person to get to educate themselves, to get therapy, to understand what they're up against, how they can help and support. Because with both with all of these components, they can live happy and rewarding lives. Yeah, it's just like it's not a death sentence. Yeah, you you manage it. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You just have to manage it. But you have to have that support and understanding and knowledge of how to manage it. Yeah. And so much of this, I mean, you change the stigma associated with mental health in America and so much opens up. I think so. So many of these things are no longer a problem. It's not embarrassing. No. And that's a long, hard road, but it's getting better a little bit. I think a little bit it is. And there is, I mean, the more that people are open about it, the more celebrities are open about it or, or anybody that talk about therapy in a way where it's just a normal thing. I try to always talk about Mm -hmm. my depression and anxiety and and therapy as just completely normal things because to me, they are normal things. You know, I'm like, I don't oh, I go to therapy. It's yeah. Like, no, and that's how it's it used a thing to be. I do. Or you were embarrassed or something. Yes. You said, I, I have an appointment. It's like, no, I'm going to therapy. I, I choose to, to be proud of it. I think so. And to, you should be. and to, uh, speak of it as I am proud of it. Like, you should be. It is, it, you know, do, you're you, only helping yourself. You Nothing love yourself. bad has ever come from going to a therapist. No. And you love yourself and you love your yeah. husband and your daughter and, uh, you know, your family and stuff enough to say, I'm going to take care of this. Exactly. It's like anything, you know, it's like me not eating a bunch of wheat because then, you know, I don't diarrhea all over the place yeah. and make it you're very unpleasant doing that for everyone. For your loved ones. I love you guys. I'm trying <laughs> to you. get a gross really rash it. and diarrhea all over the place. <laughs> All for you. All for you. Well, I felt, if I wasn't for you guys, I'd eat all the donuts. <laughs> I'm glad we ended on a laugh because this was... It's a tough episode. This was a hard one. Thanks and, for sticking with us. We got really choked up. Yes. And uh, go look at some pictures of turtles and, I don't know... Penguins. Penguins. <laughs> <laughs> Two water-based animals. Also land. Land and water-based. A humpback whale and a, a goldfish. Oh, my God. How cute would that be? So little. The goldfish could live in the humpback whale's little spout. He lives in his blowhole. <laughs> and then, and it's I like. I only let my best friends live in my blowhole. <laughs> Thank you. It's like, uh, that's his like little water bowl. It's the oh, water yeah. that he spits up. Man, I've got several children's <laughs> books to write when I get so home. So many children's books. Well, yes. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, let us know if, what your thoughts were on this. And, you know, if you feel like you're suffering from any kind of mental health problems or someone in your family or a friend is, please do not hesitate to seek help out for yourself or seek out ways to help those that you love because together we can all destigmatize, destigmatize and break down these barriers that I have been up so. for way too long. Well, I would say, so what do we think? But I think we've I think we summed pretty it up. much covered what we think. Yeah. Like you said, there's no winners and it's just, it's just yeah. heartbreak for everybody. It so. is. It's one of these things that probably with the right help was preventable. Avoidable. And you, there's nothing you can do to change what happened. And all you can do is learn from it and try to prevent something like this from happening in the future. I agree. Well, many of you have asked if we have a Patreon where you can donate to the show. We do. Our show will always remain free, but if you wish to donate to help offset the cost of making and hosting the show, you can visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner. You can get some sweet perks like Patreon-exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, a special shout-out on the show, and a monthly bonus mini-sode. Be sure to stick around at the end of the episode to hear your special Patreon shout out. Also, many of you have posted pictures of yourself wearing our lovely Sinisterhood merch. If you want to look as cool as them and as cool as me, I wore mine on my delayed flight last night. Mm. It was very comfortable as I sat on the runway in Oklahoma City in my Keep It Creepy tee. Then you can head to Sinisterhood.com and click shop in the top right corner. We have all kinds of cool stuff, shirts, mugs, canvas bags, hats, clothes for your baby or your dog we're not judging put a onesie on your dog do, you do it please. you do you send god us a- somebody buy a onesie and put it on their dog and send us a picture <laughs> it'd be amazing we would love that love that's it. what you could do to help us with this episode <laughs> please do head to sinisterhead.com and click shop in the top right corner well the best thing you can do to help us grow is like review and subscribe on itunes or wherever you listen to your podcast and please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out it means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod or like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter at Christy or GTFO. I recently went to the Art of the Brick exhibit at the Perot Museum. It is all Legos. Congratulations on your new lover. <laughs> 
The photo is Thank on you. your Instagram. Yes. Beautiful. Also, congratulations that the artist, Nathan Sawaya, liked my post. Ooh, girl. So that was exciting. Hell yeah. It's um a great exhibit, though, if you're in the Dallas area. And I know he it, it tours, but it is... Dude. I gotta go see. I can't even put together, like, a tiny little building with Legos. <laughs> I was blown away by this. It's amazing. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Heather, where are you at on I'm the internet? On Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Thanks so much for all of you who subscribe to our Patreon. Here are your Patreon shout outs. Liz. Joyce Loveless. Kelly. Krista Swain Randolph. Sarah Cavanaugh. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much and keep it creepy. Sinister. Food.